Afternoon, everybody. Sarah Gardner here, uh, one of the coalition members for the Legs Matter campaign. So welcome back this afternoon uh, to this uh, industry led session. So um, we've got four speakers today um, and we're going to run each of the four presentations and then we'll take some questions at the end. So please, um, if you think of any questions, uh, to do with any of the four presentations, just post them uh, as they come into your head and, and we'll take them at the end. So um, I'd like to thank Huntley, um, who are supporting this industry-led session this afternoon, and it's entitled Going Beyond Compression to Heal Wounds. So this really is about, you know, if you have a lower limb wound, you've got full compression on and wounds are still failing to heal, what else can be done to improve that? Um, so, as I said, we've got four speakers and I'd like to introduce the first speaker. And that is Dr. Rhys Morris, who's a consultant clinical scientist from the University of Wales in Cardiff, who's going to be talking to us about how intermittent pneumatic compression improves venous and lymphatic return to the legs. So I'm really looking forward to the session myself. I hope you enjoy it. And as I said, post your questions in either the chat or the Q&A box. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rhys Morris, and I'll be discussing how intermittent compression improves venous and lymphatic return from the legs. A good place to start when we're thinking about venous and lymphatic return is to understand how blood flow works. So blood flow flows along a pressure gradient. So it goes from a high pressure to a low pressure. And the high pressure is generated by the left side of our heart. So as it contracts and pushes blood into the aorta, as we know, it's got a pressure of about 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. That blood then has to pass through the arterioles into the capillaries. And all the while, the pressure is reducing such that by the time it gets to the veins, it's got quite a low pressure. 10 or 20 millimetres of mercury at most. So there's a large pressure gradient between the left and the right heart, ensuring blood flow, but a very low pressure within the veins. So what's the problem? Well, we have evolved to stand upright. And by doing that, we've placed our hearts a long way above our feet. So the blood that's in your feet that needs to get back to your heart has to work against gravity. There's effectively a whole column of blood extending from your feet to your heart, weighing down, preventing blood getting back up. And that hydrostatic pressure counteracts the pressure gradient, such that without some help, it will be very hard to get blood back out of your feet when you're standing up. Well, we've evolved ways then of helping that blood getting back. And there are two main ways, the muscle pump and the respiratory pump. Now the muscle pump is where we have evolved that the main blood coming out of our legs is through what would be the venae comitantes, the veins that uh, run alongside your arteries. And because they pass within the muscle, that means that these deep veins when those muscles contract, when you're exercising, compress the vein and eject the blood. Of course, that blood could be ejected in either direction. It could be ejected back to your feet. So we also have valves in the veins that prevent that blood falling back down. So as your muscle contracts, the blood is squeezed back to your heart. When your muscle relaxes, it doesn't all fall back down to your feet. And here we can see an ultrasound image of a valve inside the vein. And you can see it opens and contracts quite efficiently. There are long valve leaflets here. And when the muscles relax, it is very effective in preventing blood flowing back down. Now, the respiratory aspect is that in addition to that, those veins coming out of the legs pass through your abdomen. And as you breathe, the diaphragm moves 
and changes the pressure in the abdomen. And that change in pressure squeezes and uh, allows your iliac veins to relax every time you breathe. So a normal waveform from a vein might be quite flat, but when you breathe, you will get some undulations caused by the changes in pressure. And that change in pressure effectively sucks the blood out of the veins in your legs as well. So those two in combination mean you've got a way of returning blood to your heart more effectively. But they do rely on your breathing naturally and on taking some exercise. So it's not always very helpful, for instance, if you're standing still for a very long time. Another problem is, of course, those valves may not always work. And this example of an ultrasound scan shows what happens when you squeeze a leg where a valve don't work. The blood is moving in both directions. You can see a blue and then a red flash rather than in one direction, which you get with an intact valve. Venous incompetence then can lead to accumulation of blood in the, in the legs, and that leads to chronic venous insufficiency and possibly venous ulcers. The lymphatic system is slightly different, mainly because it's very difficult to measure the flow of lymphatic fluid. It's, it collects interstitial fluid, so the, the plasma that's filtered out from your capillaries goes into your tissue spaces, picks up bacteria, waste products, all kinds of things. And then through these capillaries into lymph vessels, they're filtered in the lymph nodes, which we have distributed around the body. And then they end up back in the circadian veins, back in the circulatory system. So they're a kind of accessory drainage system for the body to help get fluid out of tissue. The way they are assisted in getting fluid back, because of course they don't have a high pressure either, is that they have what's called intrinsic contractility. So rather like heart muscles, they can, they've got lymphatic muscles that allow them to contract on their own. They also have valves, just like the veins. And if they're next to the heart or next to the abdomen, or even next to muscles that you're moving, that compression, that extrinsic propulsion also helps the uh, lymph return back into the circulatory system. But the reason we get lymphedema, the reason we get swelling because of poor fluid return is not because of incompetence in those valves, particularly more general damage, scarring, blockages, sometimes from um, parasites, malformations, very common after radiotherapy and, and types of surgery because the lymphatic channels themselves are damaged. It's not that um, lymph is flowing in both directions as far as we know. Now, where does intermittent compression come in? Well, intermittent pneumatic compression is rhythmic compression of your legs with pneumatic cuts, so just bladders of air around your leg that inflate and deflate in a cycle. These can be used when you're not exercising, when you're supine and you're seated. And the reason they are effective and the reason they have lots of beneficial effects is because they're simulating the action of your calf muscle pump. So that, that contraction of the muscle when you move, which normally squeezes on the veins and the lymphatics, is simulated by the cuffs. And so they force blood and they force lymphatic fluid back towards your heart. And if you have valvular incompetence, damage to your valves, perhaps you've had a previous DVT, they can additionally be effective if you have multiple chambers that act in the place of valves to stop any blood flowing back down the leg. So the best way to think about intermatic, intermittent pneumatic compression is as passive vascular exercise. It's an exercise simulation for people who cannot exercise because they have wounds, because they're bedridden, or other reasons. Thank you. Thanks, Rhys. That was really interesting and some really good images there, sort of depicting sort of venous flow and sort of valve function. Um, 
So if you have any questions, Maurice, can you please put them into the chat or the Q&A uh, and we'll take those at the end. So thanks again for that really interesting session. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Anita Roberts. And um, Anita is a registered nurse and she's the National Sales Manager and Clinical Advisor for Huntley. And um, Anita is going to talk to us about ABPI, so Ankle Brachial Pressure Index, and um, what the correct uh, technique is and some hints and tips as to how to, to undertake this diagnostic. So uh, uh, over to you. Thank you, Anita, and questions at the end. Good afternoon. My name's Anita Roberts. I'm the UK Sales Manager and Clinical Advisor for Huntley Diagnostics. And I would like to spend the next 10 minutes taking you through correct ABI, some handy hints and tips. Uh, this session normally takes me two hours and we've got 10 minutes, so uh, I do hope you are able to deem some good points from it. Thank you. So um, let's go through our ABI handy hints and tips. So the rationale. ABI is the most widely used non-invasive vascular assessment procedure that we do. And there are several different international organisations uh, and they have produced guidance documents on how to do ABI procedures. And you can see these all listed with nice sign task, uh, all downloadable um, from the web. There are several ways uh, the ABI being used, the most common being assessment of patients with PAD, peripheral arterial disease, and assessment of arterial status prior to applying compression therapy to venous or mixed etiology ulcers. Just a quick comment on palpation uh, of foot pulses. As part of a holistic assessment, this is fine. I mean, a pulse tells you blood flow is present, but it gives no means of quantifying the blood flow. So I always think it's quite important just, just to mention that. This next short video will take you through obtaining a brachial systolic pressure. Important to remember, you will see one arm being done here, but we do need to repeat the procedure on the other, one, on the other arm. Really important to do two brachial systolics because we need to take the highest. Using the Doppler, first the brachial systolic pressure is determined in both arms. Making sure the patient is relaxed and comfortable, the cuff is placed around the arm. Palpate the brachial artery and then apply gel. Using the Doppler, locate the artery and hold the probe about 45 degrees to the skin. Inflate the cuff until the sound disappears. and then slowly deflate at around 3 mm of mercury per second. The point at which the sound returns is the brachial systolic pressure which is then recorded. So now let's move down to the lower limb and our pulses that we can pick up. Um, this is just a quick tip on um, position of our probe. Uh, what we want is uh, a position of 45 degrees towards the vessel that we are examining. Uh, so that's really important. That's depicted quite nice there. Uh, incorrect position of a vessel, that is a 90 degrees. That is incorrect. So this is just looking at the arteries uh, in the foot, where to pick them up, and some handy hints and tips on, on where they are and how to access them. So I always think of posterior as behind, anterior is frontal. So we need to take the one vessel from the posterior tibial artery, which lies just below the medial malleolus. The anterior tibial artery, when I'm teaching students, I say, think of the anterior tibial as a river. The anterior tibial is coming straight down the front of the leg and the front of the foot. So if we think of that as the river and we want to cross the river, we can draw a couple of bridges. And by a bridge, I mean a line of gel. If we do a line of gel between the medial and lateral malleolus and slowly work across, we will pick the AT up. We have to. It's coming straight down the front and we're working across. Another little bridge across almost the bridge of the foot. A line of gel works slowly across and we will pick the dorsalis pedis up 
Another vessel that is becoming quite commonly used now is the perineal. And the perineal bifurcates over the lateral malleolus. So you can find it more or less just on top of the lateral malleolus. And you're finding this being used at the moment a lot in podiatry. As nice suggests, it could be spared of calcification. So great for your diabetics. So this next short video will take you through placement and angle when we move down to do the pulses in the foot. Then the ankle systolic pressure is determined from both the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial arteries. The cuff is placed around the leg just above the ankle. Gel is applied and then using the Doppler probe, locate the dorsalis pedis artery and optimize the signal, holding the probe at about 45 degrees to the skin. Keeping the probe still, the cuff is inflated until the sound disappears and then slowly deflated until the sound returns. This is the ankle systolic pressure and should be recorded. So this slide is telling us how to calculate the ABI. We have done two brachial systolics. We document the highest. Important to do two and we document the highest. We have done two pedal pulses on the left foot, two pedal pulses on the right foot. We've done two and we take the highest. The way to calculate and get our ratio of ABI is A over B. So we want ankle over brachial. So I've, my highest brachial is 150. My highest pedal is 85. So ankle over brachial giving me an ABI value of 0.57. And we repeat the procedure on the other leg. Um, just a very quick mention, I will not go through them all because we haven't got time, but these are just some intrinsic factors that you may want to be aware of when you're doing your initial holistic assessment prior to ABI. These are intrinsic factors that could affect the outcome and the value of your ABI. Um, as I've said, we will supply you with a link for this masterclass. It has a full voiceover and crib notes, so you can look back on this in more detail at any time. And um, if you think of that procedure that we're doing, we're placing a cuff around the lower part of the leg and we're inflating quite, quite high, when would you not do it? You wouldn't do this if they had a suspected DVT, uh, cellulitis or patient non-compliance. What ABI values are we looking to work with? Currently, we're looking at 0.8 to 1.3, but I always say please check your local protocols as they may be slightly different. Uh, the next few slides before I finish are just showing you um, how valuable pictorial evidence can be um, when we're doing Doppler, when we're listening, if our angle is correct, it can all affect what we hear. So I'd just like to take you through three example sounds and then I would like you to try and guess the last sound. OK, I'm not sure how many of you would have got that right, but very difficult. I mean, that last sound sounds more than one phase. It sounds to me like a biphasic signal, but it's actually a monophasic signal with quite an artery diseased vessel. And it's almost like a quiver, not an actual another phase. Um, I know that's a lot to take in in 10 minutes. Uh, I hope that's been a little bit of help. And as I say, please use the link, watch the full masterclass. Uh, it does have voice and notes. And should you want to ask any questions, I'm very happy to share my email and you can come back to me at any time. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Anita. That was brilliant. Um, I think ABI or ABPI is an area 
that there's a lot of sort of uh, nervousness around it and um, clinicians uh, can get quite anxious about whether they've got the diagnostic right, the result right. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that at, at the end. So uh, thanks for that. That was really useful. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the third speaker, and this is Cher Byrne. And Cher is a clinical sales specialist for Huntley. And uh, Cher's going to be introducing their intermittent pneumatic compression product co called Wound Express. So uh, again, if you have any questions for either the other two speakers or Cher, uh, please do post them into the uh, questions box. So um, over, over to you then, Cher. Thank you. My name is Cher and I am the Clinical Sales Specialist supporting Wound Express, an intermittent pneumatic compression IPC device for lower limb wounds. In my session this afternoon, I'm going to explain how this form of IPC works. To begin with, I'm going to share this introduction video with you. Wounds are a common, expensive and frustrating clinical challenge. We've tried everything. From iodine to the honey, I had stem cells, which didn't work. Oh, it's been horrendous. Patients with chronic wounds see very little progress and very little consistency in the delivery of care from a range of healthcare professionals over a long period of time. I had um, a small ulcer on my leg. 12 years ago now and it's just grown and grown and grown. <laughs> Instead of getting better it's got worse. The longest patient I've seen with an unhealed wound has had an unhealed wound for 59 years. You have to help the body return fluid to the heart and that is why the cornerstone of treatment has been seen to use bandages or stockings on the lower leg as a means of assisting blood flow, venous blood flow, back to the heart. She struggled with tolerating the levels of compression you would want for yeah. somebody who's got a venous leg ulcer. Anne's been looking for answers for years, like Maya, who has an ulcer that refuses to heal completely. Oh, just so. It was so. Very frustrating, very, very frustrating. She, she doesn't like it's been so long but they can take up to two to three years to heal, even longer. The speed of healing reduces as it gets to the final stage of closure. What we need is enough pressure to help it return flow to the heart, but not pressure that damages the skin. And John's wound will heal, but breaks down again all too quickly. It was here, and it was about four centimetres long, and about a centimetre wide. And all this, was a wound. Yeah, at one point, wasn't yeah. it, in the beginning? Yeah. These three challenging wounds are being supported with an innovation that's making waves on a number of levels. Wound Express. You can feel it squeezing and then it, then that'll stop and then the air will go out of it again, then it'll come, keep going back and they'll do it on a circle then, or cycle, and then I'm asleep by then. <laughs> It does blow up and get tight, and then it goes down, and then it'll stop for a little bit, and then we go again. And down in this lower leg here, something is, <laughs> is going on. It's just pump, I can feel it pumping. I can feel it going down through my leg, and it just feels great then. Every, every evening we put it on about two eight o'clock, two hours, and it's work then, and go back to clinic then. Something that I've very rarely seen in a long career in the wound healing space is something is the real game changer. The advantage of using combination technology where you may have some baseline compression on the leg but using additional compression with the sequential uh, squeezing of the thigh may well provide new ways of dealing with what we have seen as very challenging problems for many years. You're able to actually squeeze a little bit more than you would be on the lower leg as we're reducing the edema in the leg, increasing or more effective blood flow. 
and this wounds are healing. It's been horrendous, but now it's my pain is almost zero. <laughs> it appears to be very effective at reducing pain or discomfort in the lower limb. I haven't had pain for a while since I've been on the treatment with the girls. Although we can heal around 70 to 80 percent of everything we get asked to see, we can't heal everything. But if we can reduce the pain, the leakage, the smell, the problems that the patients are experiencing, that in itself will pr produce benefits for the patient. Anne's wound is visibly improved after just eight weeks with Wound Express, using it in the comfort of her own home for just two hours a day. So she was having breakdown of the wound and macerated tissue down the end here, and that's a lot better. And I think the whole of your skin yeah. is much softer, so she had a lot yeah. of swelling, which makes it really tight. But actually, that's a lot softer than yeah. it's been oh, yes. for a long time. In 40 years of working in the wound healing space, this is one of about two or three things that's made me sit up and say, wow, this is making a big difference. Wound Express accelerates healing through compression, supporting good venous return and delivering nutrients and oxygen when and where they're needed most. I could easily see the Wound Express being part of gold standard of care for leg wounds. It is new, it is different and it's revolutionary. In just six weeks, it's got Maya healed and back in her heels. Just eight weeks of treatment has transformed Anne's life. Best thing since sliced bread for me. <laughs> so what is this form of IPC? Well, this form of IPC works by utilising a unique and patent sequence of inflation and deflation of three chambers of the designated garment. The pump inflates and deflates each chamber in a unique, unique patented sequence. This sequence moves venous blood out of the thigh. One of the chambers is always inflated, preventing venous reflux. This creates a pressure gradient in the venous system, allowing fluid below the knee to move towards the heart. This cycle continues for two minutes. The inflation cycle then stops for two minutes. The body has an ischemic response and increased arterial flow. In this way, waste blood and lymphatic fluids are moved away from the wound site while oxygen and nutrient rich arterial blood flow is increased. I would like to end this session by showing with you an animation of this process. The thigh garment has three chambers which inflate up to a pressure of 60 millimetres of mercury. The chambers inflate and deflate as shown here in a special patented timing sequence. This sequence pushes venous blood out of the thigh, which in turn draws venous blood up and away from the wound site in the lower leg. The special sequence of compression prevents venous reflux, which of course is often problematic in patients with leg ulcers. The active pumping of blood out of the venous system causes a drop in venous pressure and this acts to increase the arterial venous pressure gradient, which subsequently draws arterial blood down into the lower leg and wound site. This improved venous and arterial blood flow helps to heal the ulcer by, for example, increasing the delivery of oxygen and nutrient rich blood to the wound site. Thank you for watching my presentation and I am that you have further understanding of this form of IPC. Please enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Cher. That was fascinating. What an interesting, uh, innovative product. And uh, it's it was really great to see the sort of positivity in, of, of, on patients, really, where, where there's been an, an improvement. So that, that is brilliant. Um, so we're now moving to our fourth presentation. And I'm delighted to introduce Kirsty Kettlety, sorry, Kettle, Kettley, who is a registered nurse. And um, Kirsty is also a research nurse at the Welsh Wound Innovation Centre. And uh, Kirsty is going to talk to us, really give us the, the user or the patient perspective on, on um, having this particular therapy uh, and the impact on, on their lives. So over to you then. Thanks, Kirsty. Hi, my name is Kirsty Kettley. I'm a senior research nurse at the Welsh Wound Innovation Centre. Today I'm going to be talking about 
my perspective and experience of using thigh intermittent pneumatic compression therapy. So if I start with a bit of background, the first time that I used the thigh IPC device was when I was involved in an evaluation. We had 16 patients who completed all who had lower leg venous ulcers. The patients completed 16 weeks of using the thigh IPC device for two hours each day and this was used alongside their standard lower leg compression therapy. We would see them once every two weeks where we would carry out wound assessments, take photographs and collect information on wound related pain and device acceptability. Prior to carrying out and being involved in this evaluation, I had never experienced using a thigh IPC device or looked after a patient who would use one as part of their care. I felt like I was very much going through this journey with the patients week by week. We included patients who had lower leg venous ulceration. Some of these patients were experiencing ulceration for the first time and for others, they had experienced recurrence of their wounds. We included wounds that had been present for three months up to 12 years. All the patients included were wearing lower leg compression in the form of compression bandages, hosiery, wraps or multi-layer tubi grip. So from my perspective as a clinician and a research nurse, I very much reserve judgment until we have some facts and figures, which is very much the nature of my job. But in a nutshell, our findings suggested that the thigh IPC device we used was an effective adjunct therapy for patients with venous leg ulceration that were hard to heal. At the end of the evaluation, out of the 16 patients, four had healed, we saw a reduction in wound size in 11 patients and one wound remained static in healing. More surprisingly, I think this was an outcome we didn't particularly expect, 13 patients saw a reduction in wound reported pain and the other three patients who took part did not report any pain from baseline, so there was no difference there. All of the patients who experienced wound related pain at the beginning of the 16 weeks saw a reduction in pain levels by the end of the 16 weeks. This is when we realised that this wasn't just a therapy to promote wound healing. It could have benefits in wound management where pain is sometimes the most severe symptoms for some of our patients. Patients found the device very easy to use. We were able to provide them with a therapy that they could carry out at home at their own leisure. I think this is something that's become quite prominent lately with the pandemic where more patients are taking on the onus of their wound management and wound care. So this is a therapy that can be done at home. I feel that thigh IPC will become another tool in our toolbox where we can use it as an adjunct therapy when we are treating patients with venous disease and hard to heal ulceration. From a patient's point of view and perspective, we collected data on their wound and wound related pain, but also information on the acceptability of the IPC device. And this included questions like how comfortable the thigh IPC was, how easy the device was to use and how easy the thigh cuff was to apply and remove. 11 patients reported that they felt the thigh IPC device had a direct impact on the healing of their wound. 13 patients experienced a reduction in wound related pain, with five reporting a complete resolution in pain levels. Changes in levels of limb edema was not measured. However, four patients reported a noticeable reduction in limb edema. All patients found the device easy to use. 95% found the thigh garment conformable, easy to apply and easy to remove. We found that as the thigh IPC was remote from the wound, it enabled all patients to tolerate the device very well, as it was not situated on or near their wounds, so it didn't cause any additional pain or discomfort for them. Some even said they would fall asleep with the device on. 99% of patients involved in the evaluation found the therapy comfortable and would recommend the therapy to another patient. And although the device was widely accepted, we included patients with a mean age of 65 years and these tended to be the older population 
so finding two hours within the day to apply the device was relatively easy for them. But for the younger people who have a busy family and work lives, this may not be so easily accepted to find the time for this therapy. So that was just something that we were, we were aware of. But moving on to our case study then, this is a case study of a 74 year old lady who was involved in a 16 week thigh IPC evaluation. She'd had this chronic wound for five years and has history of recurrent ulceration with cycles of frequent wound infection. This lady would often struggle with wearing her compression therapy due to a variety of factors, but mainly pain and discomfort. She began the evaluation and within two weeks noticed a reduction in wound reported pain levels and an increase in tolerance of her compression therapy as a result. She continued to complete the 16 week evaluation and she swore that she religious, religiously wore her compression therapy throughout. At the end of the 16 weeks, we saw just over a 70% reduction in wound size, a reduction in wound related pain. So at baseline, her pain levels were continuous and she was scoring 91 out of 100 in pain levels, where 100 is the very worst pain imaginable. At the end of the 16 weeks, she scored her pain at 26 out of 100, and the pain was then intermittent and far more manageable. This was a very significant outcome for this lady, as it improved her quality of life, her relationship with her district nurses, and her tolerance to compression therapy, and basically her overall well-being. Another interesting outcome was that during the 16-week evaluation, this lady's wound remained infection-free. Now we've known this lady for a number of years and she and we've been caring for her wound for a number of years and she would have very frequent and recurrent infections which would require hospitalisation and very often oral antibiotics. So during the 16 weeks she remained infection free which is quite unusual for her and um, it's not an outcome that we measured but it is something that we noted for this lady. And she went on to heal actually after the evaluation um, and she's been doing really well. Thank you very much for your time. Wow, that was brilliant. Thank you. And um, certainly I've got um, lots I'd like to ask you, uh, but we do have some questions in the, uh, the Q&A box. Um, so first of all can we just sort of recap on um and, and i don't know if you all want to switch your your cameras on now so we can see your lovely faces so i can then decide who i'm going to pick to answer the question so um first of all can we just sort of confirm um so when you're talking about intermittent pneumatic compression and this seems like a really amazing innovation and it sounds like you're having a lot of success and maybe some of the outcomes you weren't expecting, which I think is fascinating. But first of all, sort of what sort of patients that would you um, select to use this product on? Um, you know, because obviously people are embark on a standardised treatment plan, which usually predominantly is compression, isn't it? So what point would you think, do you know what, this isn't working and maybe this product would be an option maybe um i'm not sure who wants to answer that share do you want to answer that yeah so the, the sort of patients you're thinking of is the ones that have had you know you've already gone through your your gold standard compression and they just need that extra something in the toolbox to to bring them forward on um so you've done your compression you've done your assessment uh, and it's just got stuck so it's not the last resort but it's part of that progress within that wood I think you've seen that with your patients Kirsty didn't you so basically and patients who have got a bit of Im immobility you know we've seen I've seen lots of patients who've got fixed ankles who have just got haven't got that calf movement to get the venous return and it's really helped with them with that as well yeah, I, th I think, you know, certainly immobility may be where you, you know, you, as you said, either fixed ankle joints, which is a problem for the calf pump, but those people who who are immobile and would find sort of trying to activate it sort of um, passively may be uh, difficult. So, uh, yeah. Were you going to add something then, Kirsty? I think? Oh, I don't know if you're not on mute. I can't see your mute button, but we can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> 
no, no. Do you want to go to Anita while we try to sort that out? Um, just to comment, and I think, you know, Reese has a massive wealth of experience on using this, but we, we never intended really to use to pick the worst of the worst, but that that is what happened and it did fantastic. So it was an even it was an even bigger response. Um, but Reese, uh, would you comment on what type of patients you would see? There's no reason in principle why it couldn't be used on any patient. Um, yeah. There's no harm. It doesn't interfere with any current treatments. And it, it may benefit anybody. Um, that it's been brought in as a last resort is understandable given pathways, but it could benefit patients with much uh, less serious or, or less chronic wounds. Um, it, but yeah, there is something in there better. around that, Reese. about, you know, are the patients that you wouldn't want to use it on? So is it sort of contraindicated in any case at all? The company has some very specific contraindications in, that are with the product, but we designed it in such a way that it would improve arterial flow and be useful. So it can be used on people with arterial disease and diabetes. Um, it can be used in venous disease and in lupus, for instance. They were all part of the original testing. Um, I'm interested in this correlation with a reduction in, uh, in, in infection. Um, obviously, that was picked up. It wasn't maybe one of your primary outcomes for you know, the, the studies that you were doing. But why would that be, do you think? I'm not sure who would want to answer that. And that would be you again, Rhys. But why do you think that this lady ended up, you know, within a period of time where she had frequent infections in that wound um, found that actually she was infection free? So, you know, I get maybe something around the lymphatics and managing sort of filtering of bacteria. But would you just explain a bit more about that just so people can understand that process? My best guess is that the tissue locally is being perfused better with nutritional flow and it's removing edema. And if the tissue is in a healthier state, it's less likely to become infected. Um, we can't prove that in that, this case, but it's generally improving the environment locally for, for the tissue. Okay. That's, I mean, that, that in itself is, is really positive, isn't it? Because if you think about obviously antimicrobial stewardship and people end up on mm -hmm. numerous courses of antibiotics and topical antimicrobials. So if we can reduce that, that, you know, that would be great. Um, ABPI, Anita, you know, it, 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 it's, it's one of these things, you know, that people are very nervous about, even though they do their training, they still doubt themselves and they do it and they've done it perfectly well. And the result is likely to be accurate, but they're thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure. And just in case I'll put them in reduced compression or no compression at all or, or whatever. What, what are your sort of hints and tips about sort of trying to get people more confident in, in what they're doing and to stop so much worry? I know, and it is, and it's very, very topical at the moment. You know, I've been teaching people to do ABIs for about 20 years, and it, it has become very topical. Um, and I think for the right reasons, you know, I think there's there's lots of pathways that say now some compression is better than no compression. Um, my advice is I when I, I, I do the masterclass live, and we run them, and where I say to the nurses or whoever joins, you have done much harder procedures than this, believe that you will be confident and you can carry this out. Um, when it comes to the values, I say work with your local teams, have a look, check your local protocols, because some people will work with 0.6, some people will work with 0.75. Um, I think the debatable question at the moment is, can you apply compression without any ABI at all? And I say, as intelligent people doing holistic assessments, you should be confident in what you execute. And if in doubt, I think you, you should do an ABI. You know. So, you know, you, you talked a bit and you, you gave us some um, some sound waves there. And and I, I absolutely agree. I think it's not just about the results that you get, yeah. um, but it's uh, it's about what is it? What does that pull sound like? But um, it is tricky sometimes for people, isn't it, to sort of pick that up and any little hints and tips? As, is it just a matter of practice and listening to lots of pulses and getting used to them or? I think it absolutely is practice makes perfect. 
Um, you know, I say when you first learn to do Doppler by your third, fourth, fifth patient, you're getting really good and keep going. Um, I think you do need to learn what sounds mean. I think resource supporters on that, you know, changing the angle of a Doppler can completely take a triphasic to a monophasic. Uh, so you need to be confident. Um, I think the, the Dopplers now that have pictorial evidence do help you get your angle right. And it gives you some confidence that you've got a lovely triphasic flow. Um, and I think the example that we show at the end where it sounds biphasic, but it's absolutely monophasic. Uh, so I can understand why people lose some confidence, but I think practice makes perfect. The masterclass in full with crib notes, crib notes and voiceover is available to everybody. And we will share that link. Uh, it's free to everybody. And I say, look, listen, look, listen, and then have some practice. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to ask you about that. I mean, someone had posted around, you know, where can I access the masterclass? So yes. uh, you'll make that available for us. That'll be great. Yes. Thank you. Um, so when we're talking about using a product like this, I mean, a lot, some, someone mentioned about um, it's fascinating that it's on the thigh because, I mean, I think, you know, compression is applied to the lower limb. And um, certainly my experience of some sort of pneumatic compression is it's a boot that we put onto the lower limb. So, um, you know, is there anything you need to add? I mean, I think your, your, you know, the, the, um, the explanation around that and the different chambers was really clear. But um, it's, is it, is it, when patients are using it, I mean, we have that feedback there, but is there any discomfort at all? Or, um, you know, is, is it easy to put on for patients? Someone's asking about, you know, supported self-care, and this is something that patients will be able to do themselves. I, you know, Kirsty, did you have, when you were working with patients, was there any problem with them applying this themselves? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, so all of our patients found it um, completely acceptable and um, they tolerate the therapy really well. It, I think it's been made so um, easy for patients. It is like a blood pressure cuff that sits on the thigh. Um, so if you're able to, you know, if you've got the dexterity, so that's another thing. It's all about assessing our patients and the environment. So it's not always going to be suitable for every patient, although it is very simple to use. I think dexterity needs to be um, assessed in our patients um, and the ability to put on a blood, it, it's like putting on a blood pressure cuff, but obviously you've got two hands, so it's far easier. Um, and you just switch on the machine and the therapy starts. So um, it was, it, you know, it was widely acceptable with all our patients. Nobody had any discomfort. Everybody would recommend the therapy. Um, but going back to assessing your patient and assessing the environment, you know, as well as making a diagnosis of a venous leg ulcer um, and using the therapy because they've got a venous leg ulcer, just making sure that they are able to um, understand the therapy. Education is really important because we all know that um, to increase to increase um, their ability to use a the therapy, they need to understand it. Otherwise, they may not use it. So it's all about our assessment and our education um, and you know touching on the the self-care and the collaborative care with our patients yes they can do it at home but again we need to be assessing the environment because um you know if they is it a fall risk because it's a it's an extra attachment for that patient so it could become a fall risk um if somebody is quite immobile and they've got carers coming in I wouldn't particularly advise to rely on the carers to apply and remove the cuff because if something was to happen um, to the patient or there was an emergency, you know, they, they, they're not able to remove that cuff then to, um, you know, to, to get to safety or if they have to leave the house. So it, it's about thinking of those factors as well. I don't think it's, it's not, suit, not going to be suitable for everybody um, if we're thinking about the environment as well. So it's all about a holistic assessment of a patient. Can you just remind me of, of how frequently it needs to be used? So we've used it in our evaluation. Um, we use the IPC device for two hours a day over a 16 week period. Um, but, you know, patients and say would often sleep, fall asleep with the device on. Um, it's completely safe to use it for a longer period of time. But the two hour time frame was something that that was provided by the company for us to work with. But definitely patients use it for longer. Mm. Um, 
The pain thing really fascinates me. And in fact, there's been some sort of comments about that because I think pain is a particular problem, isn't it, with, with leg ulceration? And despite, you know, um, analgesia plans, we sometimes can't get on top of it. So what's going on there then? And, and why do you think, again, that was possibly something that you didn't set out to measure? Uh, but it seems to be that that's been a, a factor that pain reduce reduction has been you know apparent or significant quite a few of your patients mentioned that that the pain free now or significant pain reduction so why why is that then what is it some sort of stimulating some sort of chemical pain re, you know reduction stuff so I'm waffling on here I can't get the right word but um is is why would this be helping pain I've got a few ideas in terms of maybe reducing limb congestion with oedema but is there something else more systemic or in terms of chemicals going on Reese, Reese do you want to answer that or yeah, Reese do it <laughs> <laughs> intermittent compression in general has all kinds of fascinating effects on hematological factors and vasodilators and various chemicals in the body and we don't know in truth everything it does the, the plausible reason in this case is that if you've got excess fluid in your leg, it's stretching your tissues and it's causing pain. If you then apply compression directly over the wound, the compression itself can cause pain by stimulating the nerves locally. Because here we're removing the fluid without touching the wound. We're not causing pain, but we're reducing pain. And that, that's the simplest explanation. But yes, there may well be biochemical effects at the wound site that are reducing pain as well. Um, there's a lot more we need to look into and work it out. But right from the very start, in the very first trials we did, it was noticeable that pain was one of the main effects of this device. So are you going to be doing some uh, more research? Are you maybe looking at pain specific? Uh, we've got lots of plans for different research. I, I don't know whether Anita or Cher have any further insight into that, but uh, we've certainly got plans to do a lot more research in this. I think, it, you know, certainly when pain is a problem, uh, I think there'd be a lot of interest in that. Um, so um, finally, um, if a question here, for, um, if I had a patient um, who I thought would benefit from this sort of form of IPC, uh, what would I need to do? Sure. Um, I, th I, think, I think what you need to do is actually talk to your tissue viability or your leg ulcer um, clinician to see what the, 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 the care, you know, your, how to access it and everything. Um, then they usually come back to me or Anita and we discuss, you know, what sort of patient they have. There's a lot of information on the Wounds UK, Wounds Express Consensus paper document that's been done by clinicians. And that actually looks at IPC and takes you through the whole history of it and how it improves into the, the thigh IPC. And that actually has a very nice, um, care pathway to pick you know what sort of patients what the contraindications are like um cellulitis you know cardiac failure really failure. so you've got all that involved but we've got a nice document that you can just go onto the wounds uk website and just download the pdf and, and we've got copies of that as well but really it's just talk to the clinicians who are looking after these patients um legs matters has been all, all about patients being in control of what they want and I think that's really important that, you know, if they see something that we want it, we've had a patient who has actually been the advocate and said, you know, I want to look at this, this, this product. And we've discussed it and the patient's gone on it being beneficial. And I'm sure Kirsty has had patients like this and Anita has seen it. So really just talk to your clinicians, talk to the person who's looking after it. We have the, the website as well, the Wounds um, UK com website so look on that and there's a lot of information and just email Anita and I we're here to help okay that's really great advice thank you so I uh, can't see any more questions uh, now so that's been a fascinating session thank you again Huntley for your contribution and um, just to say that our next session is coming up at uh, five o'clock uh, and that's with our patient partner, Tracy, just giving her experience and uh, I, I'll be there with her as well. So look forward to that. Thank you again and enjoy the rest Thank of you. your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.